To begin, uh, this is me, really quickly. Um, I work for Google. I'm a technology program manager. I also advise a bunch of startups uh, in London, where I'm based, uh, but also Berlin, New York, and a, and a few other locations. And more than happy to talk to startups in Amsterdam. It's a great city. I love coming here. Um, uh, I advise VCs on how I can spend their money. So if you have any spare money you'd like me to spend for you, I'm more than happy to um, invest in some good uh, wearable startup companies for you. Uh, and I tend to make a lot of trouble and, and say some outrageous things, including some very bad jokes. You don't have to laugh at any of my jokes. Um, but what got me into talking about Android and to talking about wearables was a really bad habit of saying yes whenever somebody asked me to write a book. And so I've written these three, or co-written in the case of some of these. Um, and in fact, there are another three as well that don't really have anything to do with, with uh, Android or wearables. But this is what got me into trouble with wearables, and that's kind of one of the reasons why I'm here today. All right, but that's really tedious if I'm just talking about me, so let's get that out of the way. I promise to never mention myself again. What I really want to focus on today is extreme wearables and some of the things you could do with wearables uh, if you decided to completely reinvent, revolutionize, upend, change what people think of when they think of wearables, when they think of mobile devices. Uh, I'm going to throw some statistics in every now and again, just to give you an idea of how big we're, we're talking about when we talk about wearable markets, when we talk about the opportunity out there. If you remember, you're all going to be building your own wearable device by the end of today. I said by the end of today, right? You're ready for that? You're... OK, good. So let's talk about how big things are going to be and how big things are right now, so you, you can appreciate the scale. We uh, currently have around about, I think this might have ticked over to 7.3 billion people and about 2.9 to 3 billion of those 7.3 billion on the, on the planet who have some form of connection to a communications network, whether it's the internet, whether it's something more uh, straightforward or primitive. Um, that's roughly 39, 40% of the population are online today in some form. Uh, in five and a half years, by the time we get to 2020, the population will have grown to 8 billion. But more importantly, the number of people connected will be the same. They will converge. Pretty much everyone on the planet, with a, a few outliers, will have some form of connectivity. Now, it's not going to be the good old notebook computer here or the big desktop machine, which is rapidly dying out. It's probably not even going to be a smartphone that gets most of these other people online. It's going to be a device that they've bought for fashion purposes, for information purposes, because it's a really cheap information device. Or it may even be where wearables and the Internet of Things kind of blur. Someone may have bought uh, a, a very cheap home appliance around the world. Some of the, the key appliances people look for are things like something to purify your water, because getting clean drinking water is a huge struggle in a lot of parts of the world. Well, if you had a smart drinking water filter that could tell you how pure the water was after it was filtered, that might be your online device if it's sharing data back to a network or gathering local information about um, problems with the water supply in the area that day. You may have got online through the dint of a water purifier instead of a computer or a phone. But the big opportunity here is there are 5.2-ish billion people who are going to have their first experience of a connected world, and it could be through the wearable device that you make. So you're going to be making them by the end of today, and you need to make 5.2 billion of them. You've got a few years to do that, right? But you're ready for that kind of output? How many of you run production factories anywhere? OK, a couple. All right, good, good. OK, so, uh, oh yeah, we just about squeezed these on. Um, that growth curve in the human population is like this. The online connectivity goes like this the wearable adoption is growing even faster. And this is how we can make this, this connection between everyone being online in 2020 and most of that coming through some kind of wearable device or non-traditional phone or computer device that gets them online. Um, so just by the end of this year, uh, the now number, by the way, was from December last year, so it's not quite now anymore. 
Um, by the end of 2015, we will have gone from about 100 million wearable devices actually sold, not just shipped to distributors or sitting in a warehouse, but actually sold. By the end of this year, it will be 1 billion devices. And I was in Shanghai uh, three weeks ago, talking at a conference over there, and they gave me a, a booklet that was about this thick, and on every page were 10 different wearable devices. I had no idea. That literally, you can go to Taiwan, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and buy 5,000 different kinds of wearable device. Um, admittedly, 3,500 of those are watches. So how long is your arm? How many watches can you wear at once? But you get the idea. The, the variety is exploding. The take-up is exploding. It's, it's a big opportunity. Lots and lots of um, room to play, room to experiment in the wearables world and do extreme things. So let's, let's get down to what can you do about it. How many Android developers are in the room right now? Good, good, right. You folks have got some work to do today to teach everyone else some Android development. The next uh, little bit of what, of what I want to talk about is about where Google has gone with Android recently and a few highlights of things that are um, very, very pertinent to how you might design apps for both mobile and wearables now with some of the new features and also some interesting um, uh, changes that we've made to help with some of the biggest single problems that people encounter with wearables. So this is quick. I, I promise for the non-developers in the room, there's very little code. In fact, I think there's like three words that come from code. So your chance to become a coder will have to happen in one of the other sessions. OK, so attempting to destroy the mic here. This is, this is a game I call Spot the Wearable. Where is the wearable? It's on his arm. Right, it is. So this was the ad that uh, we launched. There's the, the wearable right there. This is a wonderful, beautiful country kitchen. This, scene, this kitchen is about the size of my apartment. Um, uh, so I'm kind of jealous. This is, this is what Californians do when they invent marketing, right? Everyone lives in a giant four-bedroom house, and you'll have you know, enough space for the, uh, the table that only holds the fruit. <laughs> uh, so this was the, the ideal... Um, marketing notion of what would happen. You'd buy a wearable device, it would fit beautifully into your daily life, into your giant, beautiful kitchen, and your quiet afternoon preparation or morning preparation. Maybe he's making coffee there or something like that. Um, this didn't really turn out to be the reality a year, two years after wearables hit the market. Um, people who bought Jawbones, Fitbits, Android watches, people that are discovering it now with the iWatch and so forth, this scene turns into something that looks more like this, right? People buy all kinds of wearables. We've got um, uh, running gear like vests and shirts and so forth. This is a baby uh, monitor thing to you, like literally monitor the heart rate, breathing, um, the audio that people buy the little baby monitors for. This can do that as well. Um, babies make some terrible noises, I'm just saying. I'm going to put that out there and let you imagine what some of those noises might be. You'll have 15 different watches, a couple of fit bands. There were socks here somewhere They might have scrolled off the side of the screen. There's a, a, a pattern that we see that people buy a device, and if they like it, they'll buy a complementary device or try a different one or upgrade. But one of the biggest problems that people who design wearables have is that you adopt a wearable and you use it and you get the thing that nags you to say, Grant, you're, like this athletic figure doesn't look after itself, you better get up and do some exercise. And after a while you get sick of that and you just leave it in the drawer and you never come back to it. And then your drawer fills up with all these. Uh, so it's, it's been an issue. People are happy to try things, especially with the, the prices plummeting and I'll show you how low the prices can go. Um, but what makes people come back to use them? We use this um, phrase to describe what it will take for a wearable device to really catch on. And, and it's called, would you go back for it? Would you turn around for it? So imagine you're leaving home in the morning, you're going to work or you're going to your, your cafe where you meet with your, your friends to do your startup stuff or uh, you're cycling through the streets of Amsterdam and you think, I've left my smart socks at home or I've left my smartwatch at home or whatever. Would you turn around and go back for it? How many of you would turn around and go back for your phone if you left it at home? Right. That's the kind of response we want for a, a, a wearable device that people love, right? You think, ah, I have forgotten my crazy eyeglasses. I need to turn around and get those. So, and not the drawer full of abandoned, unloved devices. So, 
what can we do? Well, we can, first of all, we can make apps really appeal to the people who are using the devices because ultimately it's the utility and the enjoyment and the wow factor they get from this device rather than just the notion of I have a, my other watch. I'll tell you the story about what happened to my smartwatch. But you know, I've got this thing. I can, I can really live without it. We want them turning around. We want them going back to get that device. OK, so how can we make an experience that gets them back there? Here are a few Android-specific points, but some of these design ideas really translate to other devices as well. So I'm speaking to everyone, not just the eight people who put their hands up as Android developers. Um, we came up with this uh, design approach, design language, um, way of, of laying out devices for every kind of device, be it a large machine, be it a phone, be it a watch, be it uh, something on Google Glass, be it uh, one of our new devices that are coming out. Um, and we call this material design, and it's basically a set of things like fonts, um, guides to how things should be spaced, how information dense a screen should be, or sparse, as the case may be. And these are just some examples of some of the, the richer kinds of data display on a bigger screen. Um, and some of this does translate to a small screen, and then I'll talk about no screen in just a moment. Um, so for, I told you three bits of code. I think these are the two of the three bits of code. A view, for those of you who aren't an Android developer, is just a fancy name for one of the user interface widgets you see on the screen. So th this lovely bit of graphics and text and a link and so forth would be a card view, uh, a way of displaying card-like information. Um, the material design uh, extensions and implementations of these bits of code are really designed to do the hard work for you moving from one device to another so that you don't have to repeatedly think, OK, how do I lay out that information now for a, a watch face that's only 40 millimeters in diameter? Right? The material design classes and a lot of the material design framework that's built into the Android tools will help you do that for you. So you can spend more time thinking about what makes the person come back to the house and pick up the watch rather than is the button in the right place on the watch. Uh, a couple of other things that will, will appeal to anyone who's, who's used the device is bringing out that notion of depth, uh, literally the 3D effect, where it makes sense. So there are um, uh, properties and, and uh, capabilities now um, to take any of the, well, not any of the view objects, but a, a wide range of objects, as you see on these screens, and give them some kind of visual depth. Not just the traditional shadowing that you've probably seen for like 10 years, 20 years, on everything from old-fashioned Windows all the way through to you know, the latest and greatest Linux. Um, but true notions of, of depth, including what happens when items move over and behind and in front of each other, to give you a little bit of visual wow, basically. Uh, some, some animations, I'll show you some animations in a minute. Hopefully, they will work. Um, crazy things like circular reveal. So rather than just one thing sliding over the other, you can do like crazy rotating motions, animations, and so forth. Custom transitions, although this is like a slide deck. You never want to see those weird, horrible custom trans transitions in a slide deck. But maybe you do on, on a phone or something like that. You're showing someone their heart rate. You want a nice little like, beating heart transition to come onto the screen, or one of those great medical uh, uh, ECG beeping dash lines that you see in all the medical dramas. These tools inside the material design framework would let you design them. Um, and they're really, the, they do extend beyond devices with screens to devices without screens. Right? It's the same sort of, what, what can I do? What can I show people? What feedback can I give them through the sensors in the device if there's no screen? The framework is there to help you. OK, uh, with the very latest release of Android that we announced two weeks ago at I.O., Android M, which still doesn't have a, a flavor of, um, of confectionery as a code name, as far as I know, but it will start with M. You can guarantee that. Um, we added a few more fancy transitions, fancy animations, and so forth. Let me see if these actually work. Uh, probably not. So what these would have shown, if they worked, is um, a bunch of, uh, of these panels expanding in size, bouncing, like literally appearing to bounce, and so forth. Um, the animations, these were, again, scrolling and bouncing animations. If you're really keen on seeing these, you can just jump on the Android developer website and you can see examples of these in action. But again, some new animations. Something that is visually obvious and doesn't require the animation is what happens with buttons and with things that you want someone to interact with on a wearable device. 
Um, if you think about how big a watch face is, or how big a fitness band is, um, or even what kind of device interface you could have on a shoe or a piece of clothing or, so, or something like that, every pixel counts. And having to like, make space for traditional buttons and so forth is a real pain. It, it really limits you in terms of the, the, the flair you have with the layout and, and also just the functionality you can cram into the space. So we came up with this notion of floating action buttons. Um, and the, in this case, the floating action button is the, the floating circular check mark here. That's like the, yes, acknowledged button. And in this example, we've got it sort of hovering split along that blue boundary there. But we could actually place this over the top of any other uh, view element on the screen, um, which means that if you're in a really constrained UI space, if we're talking about uh, you know, literally the 40 pixels by 40 pixel kind of space, you don't have to worry about what could you cram in there. You could actually use the floating action button effect to effectively put interstitials on top of what the user is looking at to take action and so forth without having to like really cram things in there. So it's a, it's a nice feature, and you're not limited to just the circular classic sort of tick and cross and so forth. You can actually design your own shapes, triangles, hexagons, squiggly lines, whatever you like. Um, and the way you do that, uh, that's a nice intro here to this second one. Uh, again, the last bit of code, I promise. So for those of you allergic to code, the code is about to disappear. Those sorts of designs, creating those custom shapes to suit a small wearable interface. We have a class called View Outline Provider, and it literally lets you explain using vector graphics what you would like the shape to look like. You define it mathematically. Material Design Framework takes care of a bunch of the scaling and so forth across different screen sizes. So you don't have to come up with 58 different circle sizes for the 58 different sized Android Wear devices that you're going to find out there. For a device with no screen, or a device with a screen for that matter, um, I have another question for you. I like questioning my audience, interrogating them. Um, put your hand up and keep it in the air if your phone battery lasts one day. All right, keep it in the air. All right, two days. Mine's kind of almost two days. Three days, four days, a week. Right, All right we, we got close. How, how long does your phone battery usually last? About four days? About four days? OK, that's, that's pretty good. I would. I would Put that phone in a box and treasure it, because I don't remember the last time I had a phone that lasted that long. Um, battery life. With wearables, battery life is one of the biggest concerns that people have. You buy a watch, am I going to be able to tell the time this evening when I'm out having a beer? Um, it's nice when I don't have to tell the time when I'm having a beer, but that's usually a sign I've drunk too much beer. I, sh I shouldn't have to worry about whether my watch is also accurate. Um, so one of the things we have done to really help address battery life with the Android M preview and the Android M release when it comes out, is this notion of Doze. Um, and it's, it's really clever. Um, and I, I want you to think more about how we're doing this rather than just the actual battery saving. So a wearable device comes packed with sensors, sometimes only a few, sometimes dozens. Accelerometers, um, barometers, magnetometers, yeah, magnetometers or magnetometers, depending on how you like to pronounce that word. Basically things to tell you everything from air pressure to compass direction, all those sorts of things. We've taken the sensors on a device. It could be a device with no screen, like a fitness band or something like that. It could be a phone, could be a watch, could be a pair of Google Glass, whatever. And we've worked out that it's far more likely that you're using the device when motion is detected. And when motion is detected, you're, you're potentially like scrolling, tapping, jogging, whatever the case may be, you want full functionality. If there's no motion detected, um, we can infer that you are either A, passively consuming some content, but that's fine, we can see if you're playing back video or listening to audio or whatever the case may be, or it's more likely, you know what, you're not actually looking at the device right now and not, not relying on an instantaneous response. And so we've invented this um, Doze framework that uses the sensors, detects whether motion and activity is happening. And if nothing is detected, we will tell all of the background services that are like polling for updates and syncing your Facebook stuff and sending your latest uh, you know, Snapchat picture and so forth. We'll basically say, you know what, back off a little. Um, don't worry about syncing for 30 seconds. Now don't worry about syncing for five minutes. Now don't worry about syncing for 15 minutes. It's this notion of exponential back off so that the things that hog your battery power 
uh, become far, far less uh, resource intensive. They really, really um, benefit those devices that are struggling to make it a day is probably the best way to describe it. Um, the good news is this is, this is built in. Um, you can just benefit, it, benefit from it straight away. For instance, if you're writing wearable apps that use Google Play and so forth, the Google Play services are automatically hooked up to this. But you can also explicitly start using Doze and say, yep, I know that I might be using some kind of uh, endpoint in the cloud somewhere to grab data or sync data or whatever. I can make my classes Doze aware and just make certain they're backing off as well and not consuming the vital battery life. We aren't, we aren't all blessed with four days, so let's see if we can at least get beyond the day. The last, uh, 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 of course, you can never present on a Mac without an update message appearing. Okay, let's go back to here. Okay, the last thing uh, I want to recommend, reinforce, um, suggest, is of our developers out there, you probably have your favorite developer tool. Um, some of you like hacking away at the good old text command line, plain text editor, some of you like an IDE. Historically, Android was built with and supported Eclipse, very popular, also has its rough edges in places. And a couple of years ago, we launched Android Studio. And the one thing I would recommend to you if you're looking to get started or go further with wearable development and you haven't looked at Android Studio is go grab it because it does one really cool thing for you straight away, which is let you write once and target a whole bunch of platforms without having to write four different sets of code or five different sets of code. The newest release adds another one here, the um, Android Auto deployment, so if you want your app to deploy to in-car systems that are coming, um, again, uh, all of the um, package management and so forth is a, uh, built with sort of awareness of, of this sort of stuff. So with much less overhead, you could target a, a traditional laptop, a phone, some wearable devices, TV, car, and save yourself a whole heap of coding effort. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the sales pitch for Android and the three pieces of programming I promised you would, you would see. Now I want to get to the extreme part. With this as a foundation, and, and even Android aside, like I said, it's a big world, there's a lot out there, Android and otherwise. Um, if you want to learn more about our wearable stuff, there are some links. I'm pretty certain you guys know how the internet works, so I don't need to read those or tell you how to follow them. Let's talk about what you could do and what people are doing with wearables and with the data that they can get from wearables. So here's this number again, 8 billion people. They all have some kind of device. We don't need to know who they are. We don't need any personal information. Think about this at a very high aggregated level. What kinds of things could you learn? What kind of useful things could you do that you may never have conceived of before just by dint? of a whole bunch of people having a wearable device sending you some anonymized, fairly basic data. Another question. Let me just take a glass of water for a moment. OK, how many of you take your, uh, your holidays, your vacation in August? Warm weather, beautiful, yeah, out, out on the... Uh, uh, the canals and lakes, okay. How many of you remember your, your August holiday from last year? Okay, quite a few, okay. How many of you remember where you were at 3.03 in the morning on the 24th of August? Well, okay, we have, we have two people who remember where they were. Okay, sir, where, where were you? At home sleeping. I was also sleeping for a moment. And, and I think we had one more person up the back. Who's, do you remember where you were? At home sleeping was a, I was I was sleeping as well, but I wasn't at home. Oh, and exactly. There's, 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 if I gave you a random date from any time last year and said, "Where were you at three in the morning?" And most of you would think, "Well, I was probably asleep," unless it was a really good night, having a good party, or something like that. Why do I remember exactly where I was at, at three minutes past three on the twenty fourth of August last year? It has to do with this. So this building is the post office building in Napa, in Napa Valley in California in the US. I was there on holiday. My wife and I were there with some friends. We were touring the, the vineyards, drinking some wine. Uh, it's 
it's a nice, nice part of the world for drinking wine. And at 3.03 .03 in the morning, I woke up because there was an earthquake. Measured about 6.5 on the Richter scale. This is the post office building the next morning. Um, this is my, my picture. Uh, oh, actually, no, this was another one I got because it was a better angle. Um, but basically, all of the glass is blown out. What you can't see here, because it didn't actually fit into the picture, is more of these big brick columns stand on the end of the building at each end. And basically, they had stepped away from the rest of the building and were like, bricks were just falling off, the building was in danger of collapse. A whole bunch of buildings in the town were damaged by the earthquake. So I was awake at 3.03. .03. A wine bottle had rolled off the, the shelf next. It was empty, of course. I'd had a good night. Um, but I had gone to sleep. I wasn't already awake at 3.03. .03. But I also know that thousands and thousands and thousands of other people were also awake at 3.03 .03 in the morning on the 24th of August. How do I know this? It's not just guessing, it's not just thinking, well, if I woke up in an earthquake, a bunch of other people probably woke up. I know for a fact that they woke up. I know that about 80% of the people in the town woke up. And the reason I know this is I can infer it from a bunch of data from people who were wearing fitness bands to bed. They went to sleep with their bands on. Uh, my wife has one of these things. She, she used to use it to remind her to go out for a jog, and now what she uses it for is an alarm clock. She loves the gentle buzzing feature that wakes her up in the morning. It was not a gentle wake up that morning. It was, it was bang. It was a really loud shock. Things fell over, buildings damaged, and so forth. And in aggregate, these were the, these were the people who, particularly, this is from the Jawbone Company, so these people were wearing Jawbone Up. And they had agreed to share their data, just the, you know, am I awake, am I asleep, fitness sort of stuff. So, this tracks the percentage of people that were awake here on the y-axis, and this is the time as the evening draws on. Now, I mentioned it's Napa, right? Wine country. People like having a good time. So even as we get down to like 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., there's still 10 to 15% of the population awake. I think these are the people who really like their wine, right? They're really out there enjoying things. And then bang, Napa, Sonoma is the next valley over, Vallejo is the uh, town to the south, Berkeley is a little further south. We've gone from about 17% of the people awake to nearly 80% of the people awake. And we know that because their jawbone recorded the fact they woke up, they're awake, and it's pretty much obvious when they woke up all across the Bay Area, San Francisco, Santa Cruz, San Jose, those sorts of places. The further away from Napa we get, um, this is San Francisco and Oakland, Oakland is just south of Berkeley, San Francisco's on the, the west side of the Bay, I can't even remember where Santa Rosa is, but I'm, it's around there somewhere. Sacramento and San Jose are, are much further away. We're talking about uh, 50 to 80 kilometers away. Um, and then uh, Santa Cruz, um, way down on the coast. Fewer and fewer people wake up at those further distances from where the earthquake occurred. Now, I don't know about you, but when my wife bought a fitness band, I did not think that she was going to be participating in some kind of math, that mass earthquake detection in the middle of the night. But this is the kind of thing you could do with a wearable device and some very simple... I don't need to know who these people are. I don't need to know any identifying information about them. I could make a crowdsourced seismograph with just them sharing wearables data about were they asleep or were they awake. Now, I've looked at how much it costs to buy a seismograph. A really cheap one is about 50,000 euro. A very, very good one, a top of the line, expensive seismograph is about two and a half million. Um, and typically, it's like universities or research stations, um, volcano uh, monitoring stations and so forth that have these. But with a bunch of people who've already bought some kind of wearable device and an idea like, hey, I could basically make some kind of crowdsourced earthquake detector, bingo, I don't have to buy a seismograph. I get people out there becoming living human walking seismographs for me. Okay, so that's one possible application that really nobody would have thought of up front with a wearable device or with a bunch of wearable devices. What else could we do? We could predict some things. Wouldn't it be lovely to predict the weather in Amsterdam? Um, I, I used to work here um, 15 years ago, and yeah, it's... Um, it was one of my, and I live in London now, right, so the weather is still totally unpredictable anyway. Um, but so this, this is me, uh, a few, no, it was actually this morning, um, just checking what the rain would be like right here, and I'm thinking, well, you know, 
my Google search said there'd be showers. Well, what time of day and when and what would it look like? And I thought, well, I, I better, if I could zoom in, I might know a little bit more because I hear that, you know, occasionally you'll be walking down a street in Amsterdam, bang, you're rained on, but the person next to you is not, in, you know, two streets over. So you could try zooming in, but then I, I noticed uh, a really strange effect. Um, I've never seen clouds that rain sort of in perfect straight lines like this before. I don't, I don't know about you, but I, I tend to think the rain is a little more chaotic and unpredictable than that. But there is one thing you can predict when it rains. All right, and some people have just done, done the motion, running away. Um, this happens a lot when it rains, right? People do this, they put up an umbrella. Uh, it's crazy, I know, but it works. It, it, it kind of keeps the rain off. Let me just check my battery life. No, that's cool, we're fine. This is something we know people are going to do, or, or go running, as, as the gentleman back there suggested. So if I, if I could somehow detect the fact that a whole bunch of people have just done this, or a whole bunch of people have just sprinted to locations that I might know happen to have, like, gables or shelters or something like that, um, maybe I could learn something about the rain, and maybe it wouldn't have to look weird like this and have these weird triangular clouds happening. Now, there are devices like this, as well as traditional, well, I say traditional wearable devices, right? They've only been out a few years. This is the, um, uh, the device from Thalmic Labs. It's basically a bunch of muscle sensors around your arm. Um, they're not super precise, but they are quite good at differentiating between the various muscles that... Um, rotate the elbow, that move the wrist, that move the shoulder joint, and so forth. Someone wearing a device like this, or even a more modern device, uh, one of the newer watches that's come out, one of the newer um, sports tracking devices. There is an Australian company called Catapult, from where I am from. They make some very, very um, high-grade wearable devices for sporting people, who, and they can literally track everything from the degree of of flex when you impact uh, your, your knee flexing one way or the other. It's called pronating or supronating, depending on which way the knee is going. Um, it could easily detect what you're doing with your arm and the fact you might have tilted your hand this way and be holding something because your fingers are gripped like this. And with that in place, you could turn this with a bunch of people wearing all kinds of different devices, but if you could at least get the data that says they put their hands up like this, except for the 10 of them that are running for the shelter over there, you can make a much, much more accurate crowdsourced rain detector. You could literally say, yeah, it's raining here on Damrak right now, but on Prinzeskracht, it's not raining at all, and not end up with that weird blob of green that says somewhere in Amsterdam it's raining, but I'm sorry, I can't tell you exactly where. Okay, another thing you could do, which is at a a personal level, but also has wider applications, is see what you can do about changing, changing lives, liberating people from the constraints that they uh, encounter in their day-to-day -day lives. So this is a gentleman called Simon, Requ Simon Wheatcroft. Here we go, Simon Wheatcroft. Um, I'm going to tell you three, interesting, three or four interesting facts about him. First of all, he runs ultramarathons. Um, I probably couldn't even run back to Central Station if I had to, but this guy runs easily 100-kilometer marathons, 250-kilometer marathons, runs through the desert, runs urban and uh, remote marathons. He's an Android fan, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But the most interesting thing about him is that he's been blind since he was 17. And uh, I'm not blind, but I do have uh, several good friends who've told me that it's, you know, it, you can imagine it by closing your eyes, but it still doesn't convey the full depth of how it affects your life every single day. Um, Simon uh, started using Android because he wanted to leave his house, walk along the street outside his house, just walk up and down, get outside, get some fresh air. Um, and he had, he had the phone on him, mainly for, for music at the time. And he knew the street because before he went blind, he had a good mental picture of what the street looked like. So he knew he could just walk safely up and down the street. Um, one day, he was feeling particularly either outraged or adventurous or frustrated or maybe a combination of all of those, and instead of turning around at the end of the street and coming back to his house, he just decided to turn left and see where, where things went and see how he fared, whether he would like fall over the, the curb or um, run into an issue. And then he remembered this part, that he had a phone that was playing some music 
It was an Android device, and he remembered, okay, it's got maps. And maps has turn-by-turn -turn navigation. And spoken turn-by-turn uh, -turn navigation. So he turned that on and said, yep, I'm doing uh, navigation by walking. Give me turn-by-turn -turn navigation. And uh, that's a good question. I thought he used Google Now to activate it, but potentially, yeah. I'd have to ask him how he did it, whether he primed it in advance or whatever, but uh, he's, he's got a video on YouTube. Um, so go and ha uh, it might actually be in his description of, of what he did that day. Um, then he sat back and thought, uh, and this was before he started running ultra marathons. Then he sat back and thought, okay, I've got turn-by-turn -turn navigations. How far can I go? Um, hey, sure, he had some stumbles and so forth, but this device freed him from just being able to walk on the street outside his house to being able to roam across his city. Then he thought, well, this is great. I'll go for a run. And this is actually him. This is the uh, picture from the video of him running. He's never been in this location before. Actually, I think they probably staged this, right? So they probably did a few takes. He may well have been in this location. But this was new to him that day, is my understanding. Um, and he suddenly realized, if I've got an Android phone and I'm running with it, I don't know if any of you are runners, but running with something in your hand is a bit cumbersome. Most people sort of use an armband or something like that. He thought, wouldn't it, well, why don't I find an Android Wear device that can do the turn-by-turn -turn navigation or help with the turn-by-turn -turn navigation so my hands are free, so I can run with a much more natural running gait. Um, and he explored a bunch of things, including things that weren't Android devices. Um, and he's, he's come across uh, these shoes. This is a, uh, a Lechal running shoe from a company in India. Um, and it's a, it's a fairly, you know, fairly sexy design, if you ask me. I don't have them myself, I just have good old Chuck Taylors, but uh, this kind of uh, shoe is really helpful for him. It's just using Bluetooth, it's a very simple wearable device, um, but it vibrates with variable intensity. So you can basically calibrate it. If you're a runner, right, you're getting a lot of shock and vibration anyway, so little tiny vibrations are not good if you're trying to get some kind of signal. Um, but the other thing they do is they vibrate a number of times and to a certain length of time to tell you to turn left or to turn right and how far to turn left and how far to turn right. So literally as you run, you can feel the vibrations in your feet giving you the turn-by-turn -turn navigation, which if you're blind and running an ultramarathon is really helpful. Um, I, I think it'd be helpful for me just walking down the street. If we can help him, if we can help Simon, who else could we help? Uh, oh, those shoes are 100 US dollars, about 94-ish euro. Uh, not, not expensive, and in the, I think, six months since I spoke to Simon and found out about those shoes, there are probably a dozen different kinds of shoes out there that can do similar things, give haptic feedback for turn-by-turn -turn direction and other information, like your feet buzz because you've just got a text message, or you know, someone just pinged you on Snapchat or something like that. I don't know if that's useful, but it's out there. 100 bucks, 94 euro. Okay, this is a... Uh, a researcher at um, Imperial College London, his name is Aldo Faisal, and he was working on um, helping wheelchair users um, who are totally paralyzed. They literally, they can breathe and they have eye movement and that's about all they've got. And he was trying to build them a system so that they could navigate their own wheelchair just with eye movement. And he, he was using some fantastically complex um, optics, this is kind of a little uh, rig that he's got set up holding the optical device. And the idea is it's tracking your eye. It's trying to see where your eye is going because that's all you can do if you're a total paraplegic or quadriplegic. I can't remember which way around it is. You, know, you can move your eye. If we can detect that you've looked over there and you might want to turn that way, we could then instruct the wheelchair to turn that way. And this was the research he was doing. He was using optics that cost 20, 25,000 euro for each set of optics. Um, if you're Looking for a cheap wheelchair, 25,000 is not cheap, especially when all the other equipment goes into the chair. And then he had an idea. He also has children, and his children are, I think they were using a Microsoft Xbox, and of course that meant they had the Kinect controller sitting on top of the TV, and he literally, he walked up to it and looked at it and went, that's some really good optics in that Kinect controller. Um, and he stole his child's Kinect controller from, <laughs> from the TV. Now, I believe he did buy another one. He bought a replacement. But he took the, the, the Kinect controller to work. He took it to pieces. He took the optics out. Perfect. He can track movements that are as fast as 10 milliseconds. He can differentiate between you looking at something because you're interested in it and looking at something because you want the wheelchair to go that way. Um, and 
He no longer has to use 25,000 euro optics. He's using a secondhand connect, which is about 60 euro. So think about all the game controllers you have lying around at home that you could turn into wearable devices. Do you have children, anyone? Are any of your children going to scream if you take their... Think about buying a second one then rather than taking the existing one. But you get the idea. You don't have to have the huge factories, the, the massive investment. You can literally cannibalize the components you find lying around to build your own wearables. And if you, if you don't think a wheelchair is a wearable device, talk to someone who sits in a wheelchair every day and they will change your mind on that, I guarantee it. So another group, this is from MIT, this is from a few years ago, 2014. They were doing very similar things, um, but their goal wasn't to help the, uh, their paralyzed uh, co-researchers move their wheelchair, they wanted to have some fun. So again, they cannibalized some optics. Um, I don't know where theirs came from, but it was a very cheap set of optics instead of these sort of you know, tens of thousands of euro. And they built a, uh, a pickup system that you could wear, basically like a headset that you wear, and enabled people who were totally paralyzed to play Super Mario Brothers just by tracking eye movement. And their optics cost $25, 23 euros. Right. So if you're thinking, well, I can't go out and make a, the next version of Google Glass, like the market's wide open. We've, we're still taking the second version internally and working on it. You've got, you've got an opportunity right now. If you've got 23 euro in your pocket, you can probably go and buy some optics and see what you could build. Okay, that's, that's getting cheaper. You see this price is dropping further and further and further. Um, I really want to encourage you that this is something you could do for the, the price of a cup of coffee. You could experiment with wearables today for a really, really, really low amount. I'll, I'll show you how low in a moment. Okay. One statistic I want to take a, if, away with you, I mentioned blind ultramarathon runners, I mentioned people who rely on wheelchair for mobility. Um, if you're thinking, what kind of market is that? Right? Can I, can I, could I make a business helping and improving the quality of life for people who have these challenges? One in seven, according to the World Health Organization, one in seven people around the planet live with some form of disability. So that's well over a billion potential awesome hackable wearable devices you could invent and have a, a huge market out there. Okay, this is something you can do today, this is something you can do right now. Some of you may have already done it. What could you do for four euro? I think my coffee was actually cheaper than that this morning. Amsterdam some remarkably, um, uh, I don't want to say cheaper because that's not really a nice way of describing it. The prices here are very reasonable compared to the last time I worked and, and lived here. I, I, uh, I commend you all on excellent coffee for under four euro, but instead of buying tomorrow's coffee, you could instead build one of these. Who's, who's seen Google Cardboard before, right? Okay, most, okay, so I'll keep this short and sweet and then we can have questions if you want. Um, Four dollars is pretty much the price of, uh, you can go to the link to find Cardboard, including we have a new version two that takes phones up to six and a half inches in diameter, the existing version, the diagonal couldn't be more than about five and a quarter inch. Um, most of the price comes from just buying these, these lenses and the two magnets that go into it. The cardboard, you've probably got cardboard lying around at home. If not, you can, you can go to a stationery store or a craft store and buy a bit of cardboard. We have the schematics available on that URL. You can download them, literally print them out, and take a knife and cut out your, your cardboard design. Buy the lenses, buy the magnets, we'll, we'll tell you the specs for those, and build your own. Um, and not just build things that look like this, but think about what, what you could do next. I've seen a video where people have, have taken the original design of the cardboard that sits over your face and then added cardboard uh, headphone sets um, and a few other bits and pieces and just keep experimenting with it. For four euro, uh, I think that's a bargain when it comes to could I make the next great wearable device. Prototyping with some cardboard. The cardboard SDK is now available. You can go crazy, you can create apps. You all could be the next great wearable inventor right now, today. So you should get on that because I'll come back tomorrow and I expect to see some great devices. Okay. All right, but in all seriousness, um, you should plan for, whether it's Android M or another platform, the market is going to be huge. Think big. Don't just think about what one device could do. Think about what thousands of devices could do in aggregate and build some fun stuff. Make a lot of mess with a lot of cardboard 
Um, and for those of you with children, it's, you know, it's perfectly okay to be having more fun with playing with cardboard than, than your children have. So. Okay, all right. That's it. Thank you very much. And let me know if you have any questions. Thank <laughs> you.